Welcome to Chemisode Unit 3 on Medicines. This is a second last um, Chemisode video for this unit and it is to do with medicines where we're taking plants and making drugs out of them. So we're basically looking at helping people in terms of that and we're looking at aspirin and penicillin in these two um, videos. So let's go have a look at medicines. As you know, um, the units, so the notes that you can get from the, for these podcasts can be found on Edmodo, and you can see the Edmodo um, the group code is going to come up on the screen in a second as well. So you can actually go to the Edmodo website and download all the notes for the podcasts, and you can go through all those. In this um, episode, we're going to go through looking at a bit of the history about medicine and where it comes from, how we um, develop medicines. We're going to look at two medicines in particular, aspirin and how that came about, and penicillin, both um, very um, common, you, commonly used medicines. And then we're going to look at the development of new medicines and all the type of different things that uh, we need to take into account when we're developing new medicines. So this podcast, this video, will be on aspirin. The next one will be on penicillin and the development of these drugs. So let's have a look at a brief summary of how we get the history of medicine. Where does medicine come from? Basically medicine starts off or originated as being herbal remedies. Basically what happens is you, um, back in the olden days before we knew about any of this chemistry stuff, people used to just eat random stuff and sometimes that stuff made them really really sick and sometimes that stuff made them feel a bit better. And basically the idea was about bush medicine is where you take a plant, um, you can either crush it up, you can make a tea out of it, you can make it into a lotion, you either drink it or rub it on yourself somewhere and you feel a bit better. So that's basically where medicine came from. It came from the idea that um, certain plants had chemicals in them, um, so it had certain compounds, molecules in them that acted on the body in a certain way and basically helped out either blocked a feeling that you had if you felt pain um, like you might take drink some tea and that pain would go away that's kind of blocking the nerve system so you don't feel that pain anymore or some of them may have actually killed certain types of bacteria so they might be toxic to the bacteria in your body so they might kill the actual infection that is causing you issues the one that we really deal with, or the one that we're going to deal with now, is um, the willow tree, the willow leaves, and the, wi the bark of the willow leaves, and how people used to make that into a tea, or people used to eat that, and it used to block some of the symptoms of pain. And that was a basis for aspirin, which is what we're going to look at now. So the willow tree um, basically had compounds in it, or... People back in the olden days used to see that um, they felt better once they had taken um, a tea or a potion made from the willow tree. In terms of um, how we developed aspirin out of this is we analysed the willow, the willow, um, tr um, the bark of the willow tree and the leaves of the willow tree and tried to identify what the compound was that was making us feel a bit better. After we have identified the compound, what we did was we purified it. So we um, tried to get it alone by itself so we didn't have any other stuff that was in the bark or the leaves. So we purified that compound. From there, we could work out what the compound was, what its structure was, and then we can work out a way of synthesizing it ourselves, so making it ourselves. And then we can look at improving how it all worked. We're going to look at the basic... Um, these steps in terms of aspirin. So let's have a look at how we identify it and how we purify it. Basically what we saw with aspirin is um, after identifying or analyzing our um, our plant we found out that the, the molecule that was in the plant was this thing called salicin. Salicin um, when it was put into the body or when it was eaten was found out, sorry, when it was um, digested we found out that it actually turned into this thing called salicylic acid. And it was in the body that this salicylic acid actually did its job. So what this salicylic acid did was blocked um, pain receptors and um, the nerves that 
deal with pain and it basically made the aches and pains and headaches and things like that go away when you tried to when you ate the celestin stuff so what the first idea was identifying that this is the molecule that's in the plant and then identifying after digestion what it is that is actually acting on it so what we found out or what we worked out and how to do is purify this salicylic acid by itself and what happened is we started um, giving people this salicylic acid. So um, when people had aches and pains, what could be prescribed to them, what drug they actually got given, was this salicylic acid. The only problem with this giving people salicylic acid is if they had um, mouth ulcers or if they had um, stomach ulcers or any problems like little cuts and stuff like that. Being an acid, it was very, very irritating. And if you took it too much, it could actually cause um, ulcers and things like that. Um, the acidic group here, the carboxyl group here, actually causes issues with, um, and it can be really painful to take, and it can actually cause um, problems with your stomach. So what they had to do is um, work out a way of giving this to someone um, who had these issues, who had these ulcers, or who had um, these cuts and open wounds in them. So what they did, or what someone did, I can't remember who it was, if you want to know, read your textbook, but what he did is he turned um, salicylic acid into a less painful um, acetyl salicylic acid. So he changed it, changed the compound to being what we know now as aspirin. Basically, taking this OH and turning it into this aspirin thing here, giving it an ester linkage off the benzene here, or an acetyl linkage as well, I think it could be called, but the ester linkage here anyway. Basically what happens is this aspirin, um, it when you um, ingest it, when you take it in, what happens is it's not as painful, or it doesn't inf inflame the things as much as salicylic acid did. So even when, so you take this, when you digest it, it turns back into salicylic acid, but it's a bit easier on your body to um, digest. So it stays like this, it stays like aspirin until it gets into the small intestine, and then it hydrolyzes back into salicylic acid. All right, now that basically is the difference, or this is how aspirin's made. It's made from salicylic acid, and it's um, we're going to look at two ways that it's made, actually. That's the next two slides. So let's have a look at how um, aspirin is made. The first um, equation, the first way it can be made is um, through reacting ethanoic acid and salicylic acid together and to form this um, aspirin and water. Obviously, you can see here that it's an esterification um, reaction, a condensation reaction as well, where you're f reacting um, this acidic area here with the OH here, the phenyl alcohol group here. This is a simple process. It's quite green. It has a really good atom economy. This is a really good um, green approach to making aspirin. However, the problem is you get a very small yield of aspirin. That's because water is a product and if you have too much water, what can happen is it can go back the other way. This um, reaction goes forward and backwards. So if you have too much water, it will push the reaction back the other way. So this is a simple process. It's really good. It's got a good atom economy. It's quite green. Um, obviously, we're not, we're not producing anything that's really bad. We we're just producing water. But because we're producing water, it drives the reaction backwards and produces a very small yield of aspirin itself. So what they had to do is they had to think about another way, another process, another um, method of making aspirin. And here's what they did, and here's what you will learn. Basically, what they did is with ethanoic acids, they react these two together and hydro, um, not hydrolyze, condense them together to give ethanoic anhydride and water. So first of all, they react these two things together, and they make this compound called ethanoic anhydride. Okay, so an acid anhydride here where you're basically, it's like making a, two, a double ester here, but it's actually called an anhydride, acid anhydride group. What we then do is we take this ethanoic anhydride, we react it with salicylic acid, and we create aspirin and ethanoic acid again. 
This is not as good as um, in terms of atom economy as this first reaction. However, it's much faster. It's a lot of, so therefore it's faster and it produces a better yield of aspirin. It produces a better yield because what we can do is separate this ethanoic acid and react it back again and make ethanoic anhydride and push all the reaction forward. So this has a not a great atom economy. It's a little bit less green because you're not producing you are producing an acid here as well. So that's the bad downside of it. However, it's much faster. It produces a better yield of aspirin. We get a much better yield of aspirin, and that makes it a lot more industrial suitable. So it makes it a bit more viable to actually make aspirin. So these are the two reaction pathways. The first one, simply ethanoic and salicylic. And the second one is ethanoic anhydride and salicylic acid. So you need to understand these two reactions and what happens in each one of them. So, and you should know which one's better and which one's worse. That's how we produce aspirin. That's our synthesis of aspirin, how we produce it. One way we can improve aspirin is um, making it more soluble. Okay, to do that, what we do is we turn this um, carboxyl group into the um, a sodium salt of it. So we react it with um, sodium hydroxide. What that basically produces is a soluble salt of aspirin. Okay, this is an improvement because, well, first of all, being more soluble, it can get into your bloodstream a bit quicker and, and act a bit quicker. Also, it's a bit easy to take, so you can have dissolvable tablets. So you can actually put a tablet in a glass of water and it will dissolve and you can just drink this aspirin product here. So an improvement is making it more soluble and to do that, we react it with sodium hydroxide and we form the soluble salt of our um, aspirin here. Another improvement that's been done is making polyaspirin. Um, you can read about that in the Heinemann textbook. I'm not too sure if it's in the other textbooks, but I use the Heinemann and it talks about polyaspirin there as well. So obviously that is one way to improve it, is making it soluble. The other way is looking at polyaspirin. And I think the reason that's better is probably because it has um, more of this um, salicylate um, stuff here. But that's making soluble aspirin. It's improving aspirin by making it dissolvable. And we do that by reacting with the sodium to make a sodium salt of this um, acetyl salicylate, salicylic acid or aspirin. Let's have a look at analyzing um, aspirin. Now, we can analyze it in a few different ways. Um, the most important ways that we'll really deal with, um, or our exams will really deal with, are looking at it, analyzing it, through these channels here, through HNMR, even carbon NMR, through IR spectroscopy, and through mass spectroscopy as well. So let's look at um, a few of these. Let's look at hydrogen NMR, and what will the difference between these two molecules be? So we're trying to look at to see if we have any um, impurities within our aspirin, and we're going to look at the difference between salicylic acid and aspirin here. HNMR, let's have a look at how many hydrogen environments we have here. We've got one here, two, three, four, five, and then six. So salicylic acid has six hydrogen environments. If we move over to um, aspirin, we've got one here, two, three, four, five, and then six again. So we've both got six hydrogen environments on both sides. However, what the difference is, is um, this hydrogen environment will be a relative area or a relative abundance of one hydrogen, whereas on your salicyl your aspirin side of it, this is obviously a CH3, which will mean it'll have a three, um, a relative abundance of three in your hydrogen MR. So even though you're going to have the same number of peaks, you're going to have a different chemical shift and you're going to have different, um, what's it called, relative area or relative abundance. In IR spec, which is probably the most important way of dif differentiating between these, IR spec is obviously looking at the functional groups within your two molecules. And the major difference between these two is the fact that this one, or salicylic acid, it has one 
um, double bond to oxygen, so one C double bond O area group here. And this one over here, aspirin, has two. It's got one here and one here. So that means in IR spec, you'd expect one peak at around about 1700 um, centimeters to the negative one. And in with aspirin, you'd expect two peaks at around about 1700, a wave number of 1700. So IR spec would be a really good way of differentiating between these two because you can quickly see the difference in the number of peaks where you have this um, carbon to double bond to oxygen stretch at about 1700. Mass spec, obviously they're going to have different masses, so therefore you're going to have a different number of um, different uh, mass of your molecular ion. So all these things here, all these three here, can differentiate between the two. Obviously carbon NMR, this guy over here has got two extra carbon environments um, than aspirin. So, so aspirin's got two more carbon environments than salicylic acid. So what we're thinking about here is how we can analyse and look at the difference between two molecules and what will happen when you analyze them using these things here. So that's aspirin. So we've looked at, with aspirin, we've looked at all these different areas. We've looked at, um, sorry, moving back here. We've looked at the analysis of aspirin. We've looked at the identification, how we, how we um, come across what actual molecule is doing the work. We've looked at the purification. We've looked at how we synthesize it, obviously those two different equations for synthesis. We've also talked briefly about how we can improve it, making it soluble. So they're the things you really need to understand about aspirin. Um, how to analyze it, how to identify it. Um, purification, we don't really care too much about the purification in terms of that. It might be interesting to know that um, to purify aspirin, normally we recrystallize it. Um, we don't really fractional distillate Aspirin, we would normally try and do it by recrystallization in terms of your purification. Haven't talked about that much in class. Not really much you need to know about that, really. You do need to know the synthesis. Obviously, those two equations that I've talked about, you need to know the synthesis. And you need to know how to improve it, how we um, went about making soluble aspirin. And it would be a good idea to read up about polyaspirin as well. I'm not going to explain it here, but you can look at it yourself. So that's aspirin. In the next video, we're going to, as I said before, talk about um, penicillin. So I'll get that set up and we'll look at penicillin next. Mm -hmm.